Okay, I'm ridiculously hyped for Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Wanna get out of here? But there's something that's really bothering me about what seems to be Spider-Man 2099's evil plan. What exactly is happening and are we in for a major swerve? Let's break that down right now. I should start off by saying that not only do I think Into the Spider-Verse is the best Spider-Man movie, beating out some tough competition like Spider-Man 2 and Spider-Man No Way Home, but I also think that Into the Spider-Verse is one of the best and most influential animated movies of the century. So yeah, that puts a lot of pressure on Across the Spider-Verse to be, you know, decent. And one of the many things that Into the Spider-Verse did great was its villain. Sure, Kingpin probably wouldn't make the top 10 superhero movie villain list or anything, but I always loved how they stripped the character down to just a man who would do anything to get his family back, whether it was by spending all his money or even opening up a black hole in his universe. It's not like he was naive about the consequences, but it felt like to him, if he couldn't be reunited with his family, then his universe wasn't worth saving anyway. And I just love the way his all black frame just encompasses the whole screen all the time. It's awesome. And he was lucky to be paired up with the very curious and egotistical Doc Ock, who is perfectly happy to go along with the scheme. That's an underrated pairing right there. And that's why I want to talk about Spider-Man 2099, the presumed villain of Across the Spider-Verse. In this video, I'm going to be talking about what I perceive to be flaws in his overall plan, his role as a villain overall, and whether there's a secret villain we may not know about. Also, let's just get something serious out of the way. I might mess up the titles somewhere in this video. Into the Spider-Verse and Across Across the Spider-Verse always get jumbled in my head, so if I do that, then I apologize. Anyways, we knew that Miguel O'Hara, aka Spider-Man 2099, would be a big factor in the sequel thanks to his post credit appearance in the first film. Now, it's here where I start to have some questions. In that first movie post credit scene, Miguel is presented as a sort of normally goofy and aloof Spider-Man who cracks jokes and has been monitoring the multiverse for some time. He tries out a multiverse jumping device that allows him to be, as it stated, the first person to make an autonomous multiverse jump. We then get treated to one of the best Spider-Man jokes in a movie that's bursting with them as he goes to a dimension where he reenacts the legendary Spider-Man pointing meme. Now, we were all laughing in our seats to maybe realize what his goal was here. We listen as Spidey2099 says he needs this 1967 version of Spider-Man to come with him for some reason, and he's met with less than stellar results but it sure was a lot of pointing. So fast forward to the two Across the Spider-Verse trailers we've seen and things have escalated. For one, Miguel O'Hara has definitely been hitting the gym. I don't know, he looks much more jacked in this movie compared to when we saw him the first time, or am I crazy? He also looks like he succeeded in his mission to recruit different Spider-Men across the multiverse to join his team. For what purpose though is still unclear. We can assume given the dialogue about the multiverse that Miguel has brought everyone one together in order to protect it for some reason. But the how and the why and the from what aren't made immediately clear. Miguel is also just different than he was before. He's serious looking, he has a meaner and darker vibe to him, and he gives off a real cold demeanor. Well, as much as a couple of two minute trailers can really convey. So did the writers change course for Miguel's character, or has this always been planned? Because there's a way to write this in. In the comics, Miguel gets his powers because initially he's given a highly addictive drug called Rapture by the evil corporation that he works for, known as Alchemex. I'll circle back to that in a second, but in order to cure his addiction, Miguel genetically splices his DNA with a special spider, and it turns him into Spider-Man 2099, whose signature thing is that he has fangs that are poisonous, thus making him a bit more of a spider than a man. I don't think Across the Universe will go as heavy with the backstory, but maybe this addiction and this special mutation is what's changing Miguel's body and making him more villainous? That's an in-story reason why he's different looking and acting compared to the last movie. Honestly, I hope something like that's the case, because right now, I'm getting serious Kingpin vibes from Miguel. The little we do see of Miguel in the trailer is that he's looking at footage of what we presume to be his child. No one just casually looks at melancholy family videos unless there's a reason. That's Cinema 101. Miguel's family could be gone and 
that's what causes him to be so invested in the multiverse no matter the cost. It's both very similar and the complete opposite to Kingpin, if that makes sense. It's different in that Miguel's loss causes him to want to protect the multiverse no matter what, while Kingpin wanted to get his family back at the cost of the multiverse no matter what. But the same in that this loss has driven both men to be cold and obsessive. Heck, the big Miguel versus Miles fight we see in the trailer seemingly takes place on what looks like a multiversal subway train, with Miles using his electric powers to declare that he's serious and then zap the bad guy off of him, which is almost the exact same thing as the climax of Into the Spider-Verse with his Kingpin fight. Is that intentional or not? But I do think the movie could do some interesting things with the Miguel character and how he relates to Miles. But what are they? Let's talk about that a little more. The question I keep asking myself is this, is Spider-Man 2099 the right villain for this movie? And I've come around to yes, I think what vaults superhero movies into the S tier category usually comes down to the villain role. Sometimes the great ones are ridiculously charismatic to watch like Nicholson's Joker and Loki. Some of them are twinged with tragedy like Doc Ock and Pfeiffer's Catwoman. Some are understandable yet extreme like Thanos and Magneto. And in my opinion, the best category of villain is the one that fundamentally changes who the hero is and how they view the world. Killmonger and Ledger's Joker I think fit perfectly in that last category. And honestly, I really hope Spider-Man 2099 can join those ranks. And it all comes down to the story. What is happening that seems to pit Miles against the this entire spider team? Well, here's where I'm afraid the motivation is going to be a little basic. From the looks of things, it seems like Miguel is solely interested in keeping the multiverse functioning properly, no matter the cost of the individual. The classic save one or save a million conundrum that a lot of heroes are faced with. Miguel seems to be of the mindset that saving an individual isn't worth it in the grand scheme of things, while Miles will want to save everyone. What looks like the vibe of the movie is that someone close to Miles is going to be destined to bite the bullet, and Miles wants to go against destiny and stop it. It's a little unclear who, though. In the first movie, the emotional crux was between Miles and his dad, but from the first trailer of this movie, this is highlighting more of his relationship with his mom. So either one could feasibly be on the chopping block and have it still hit home. So Miles goes against everyone to save them. The problem, though, is that almost every superhero movie in existence has taught us that saving one life is always the priority, especially if that person is close to the hero. I can't think of a good example of any superhero movie where the hero starts off by saying, yeah, I completely understand that I will have to sacrifice the people I love in order to save the entire world. Worth it. Like, Watchmen famously had most of the heroes begrudgingly agree with Ozymandias about his plan at the end, but that comic and movie are supposed to be dark. So because we've seen this situation play out so many times before, I'm a little worried the movie won't be as interesting as the first one. But of course, there's other factors involved that could spruce up this overused plotline. And that's really the Spider-Man of it all. Let me explain. My question becomes, why does it seem like every Spider-Man is on Miguel's side, including Peter B. Parker and Spider-Gwen? It feels like a cop-out to think that every character besides Miles is more than willing to sacrifice one life to save the multiverse. That just doesn't track for me, and it's why I think there's more going on. But if I'm wrong, then I think we're in trouble. Let's say that all the main Spider-People aren't on Miguel's Miguel's side, and Miguel is tricking them with his intentions. Yeah, that saves the character's integrity, but also makes them look like dum-dums. So again, I ask, what can make this interesting? Well, something I'm thinking about is how maybe Miles hasn't had his Uncle Ben moment yet. One of the core ideas of Into the Spider-Verse was how every character lost someone close to them, and that's what set them on their path toward becoming a great hero. Maybe all of them realize that it's the Spider-Man's destiny to go through this pain, and if Spider- Spider-Man doesn't go through this, then the multiverse is in danger of collapsing. Maybe good guys like Gwen and Peter B. Parker are more accepting because of the pain they feel about the person they lost and understand what it takes to be Spider-Man. This pits Miles against the very idea of Spider-Man's destiny itself, and he refuses to give in. As he says in the trailer, he's going to do his own thing. I sort of like the idea that Miles is actively fighting against what is expected of a Spider-Man, and I think that opens up some interesting conversations. Of course, I know what you're going to say. For one, Miles' universe already had another regular Spider-Man who died and presumably went through all that pain, so Miles can afford to be different. The other is that Miles kind of already had his Uncle Ben moment with his Uncle Aaron, so 
asking him to go through another big loss seems like overkill, right? I mean, Miles doesn't blame himself as much for Uncle Aaron's death like Peter normally blames himself for Uncle Ben's death, but it's still traumatic. I've gotten away from my connecting Miles to Miguel, so maybe something else is at play here. Remember I mentioned Alchemix? The company Miguel worked for in the future that gave him powers? Well, in Into the Spider-Verse, the spider that bites Miles is from Alchemix. It also feels like the spider is from the 2099 universe, right? Is it possible there's a really strong connection between Miguel and Miles that will be revealed in the movie? Is it the same spider? Was that spider part of Miguel's overall plan? Does Miles gaining powers from a spider from a different universe affect the balance of the multiverse? I don't know, but all that adds an interesting layer to the story beyond just the simple narrative I laid out. Like the great villains I talked about before, across the Spider-Verse should highlight the bond between Miguel and Miles. Miguel could be what Miles becomes if he's not careful, and Miles could be the type of hero Miguel was before tragedy struck. They need to learn and grow from one another in interesting ways. That's how the sequel will succeed. Or maybe there's a deeper connection and the two of them will be united by the movie's theme. Okay, I'm sort of still workshopping this theory, so let me know what you think of it. There definitely seems to be a theme about the relationship between parents and children in this movie. I I already mentioned that Miguel is looking at footage of a kid he apparently lost, Peter B. Parker has a small child now, and Spider-Woman is pregnant and still kicking butt. So on the Spider team that Miles wants to join, that's three main characters who are parents in different ways. What if the reason that Miguel hates Miles is because the spider that bit Miles was supposed to be used to save Miguel's son from some rare spider disease? I think one of the ultimate fears for a parent is what we pass on to to our children. So maybe Miguel became Spider-Man 2099 through genetic splicing. He loved it, but then when his kid was born, it altered his DNA and made the kid sick. Miguel developed a spider to save his son. The spider hopped dimensions and bit Miles instead, thus creating a really huge conflict of why Miguel doesn't like Miles. What do you think? Does that motivation have any merit? If it's right, I'm a genius. If it's wrong, well, yeah, that's probably wrong, but it makes sense, and I'm just trying to figure out a way to make the relationship between Miles and Miguel super compelling. But now, here's another big question. Is Miguel even the main villain of the movie? Or is he trying to stop a greater threat that's going to reveal itself in the third act? These types of movies, where there are two ideological opposed heroes, usually end up in a similar way, with a bigger bad appearing at the end for the two heroes to unite against. Well, if that is the case, then who could it be? I remember Jason Schwartzman getting his own special announcement that he was voicing the villain The Spot, and the trailer does highlight him, but he he doesn't seem like big bad material, does he? He seems like a nuisance in an early act one baddie. His powers, which seem to be able to support dimensional travel, may come into play too near the end as the whole movie hinges on multiversal travel. I mean, I'm looking forward to Miles fighting him, but I don't think he's what Miguel had in mind when he formed his spider team. Another villain who gets a big highlight in the trailers we've seen is Vulture. We see Spider-Woman fighting what is probably the 2099 version of Vulture, which is fun because in the comics, that version of the Vulture is a straight up cannibal. Yeah, so imagine Michael Keaton in Homecoming, but also he eats people. Neat. But anyway, Vulture also doesn't seem like big bad material. I bet he'll function a lot like Green Goblin did in Into the Spider-Verse and just be a huge pain. So who does that leave? Well, maybe the movie is setting up a full-on Spider-Verse or Spider-Geddon storyline with the introduction of the multiversal vampire Morlin and his family of inheritors. These baddies basically like to travel the multiverse and eliminate Spider-Men because all Spider-Men are basically Spider-Totems that they want to absorb. It gets really complex in the comics about the purpose of Spider-Man in each dimension, but basically Morlin in Spider-Verse and the Inheritors in Spider-Geddon cause a lot of mayhem, forcing all the Spider-Men to team up to stop them. It would make sense that Miguel wants to form a team to stop all the Spider-Man from being eaten, but why does he not like Miles? Well, well, if my theory is right that Miles was never destined to become Spider-Man, and the multiversal spider is what changed that, maybe Miles doesn't have that special spider totem type of energy. I do think Morlin is coming, but the question becomes if he'll be introduced in this movie, or be teased for the next one. That's the tricky part of announcing two movies at once. If Beyond the Spider-Verse is the true conclusion to this trilogy, then how will this middle section work? Will Miles defeat Miguel and make his 
his own destiny, but lead the way for Moreland and Inheritors in the next movie? Or will they show up in Act 3, forcing Miguel and Miles to work together? I guess only time will tell. The Spider-Verse movie is a crowning achievement in animation and in Spider-Man movies, so the second one has a lot to live up to. Hopefully, it can not only match the heights of his predecessor, but exceed them in new ways that we can't even imagine. And one of the ways it can do that is by making Spider-Man 2099 a compelling and interesting character. So here's hoping he has a good plan. Do you think Across the Spider-Verse can live up to the ginormous expectations set by Into the Spider-Verse? How would you make a sequel like this work? Is Miguel the main villain, or is there something bigger at play here? Let me know what you think in the comments below. Thanks for watching CBR. See you next time.